Welcome to Hunting Stories, brought to you by Late to the Game Outdoors. Everyone loves a good story, and hunters have some of the best. Our whole mission is to collect and share great stories from hunters just like you, to entertain and keep you motivated all year long. So, pull up a seat around the campfire, because here we go. All right, welcome to the show. Uh, today, uh, I've got a story lined up that I don't know why I've never thought of sharing it here on the podcast. Uh, I guess because it's not technically a hunting story, though it does involve animals, uh, but it's a it's really a backpacking story. And uh, I think backpack hunting is uh, becoming, I, it seems, increasingly popular uh, just as more and more people want to uh, get away from the roads and away from other hunters and just get far back into the wilderness where those bucks or those elk or bear or whatever are hanging out, uh, there's this appeal to backpack hunting. But if you've never been backpacking, it uh, can seem super intimidating, Uh, just a daunting proposition. There's a whole lot of gear. There's a whole lot of know-how. There's some of that fear of, like, can I pull this off? And so uh, I thought this story uh, will hopefully be entertaining, uh, but also just maybe kick off a a discussion or a a thought in your mind that, man, I've been intrigued by backpack hunting, but a little hesitant to pull the trigger on it. Maybe I'm going to give it a shot. So this story takes us all the way back to, oh man, uh, close to a decade ago. So I was in my mid twenties And, uh, I, I was, I had been hunting a few times. My father-in-law had introduced me to the world, but it hadn't taken over my life yet the way it has now. Um, but I started to feel this like call of the wild, so to speak, uh, this, this drive to get out into wild spaces and, and do something and kind of test myself as a man. And so for whatever combination of reasons, the idea that started to float around in my head was a solo backpacking trip. Now, rewind even further. Uh, I was a boy scout. Uh, I made it all the way to life. And then I looked at the massive pile of badges and projects and work to be done to get to that final rank of Eagle and decided I was out. So I quit. But (laughs) in those years in the scouts, uh, I learned plenty about woodsmanship and the outdoors and how to survive. And, and one thing that I remember my favorite camping trips in the scouts were our backpacking trips. Uh, particularly there's, there's a mountain range here east of Phoenix called the superstition mountains. Uh, look it up. It's fascinating stuff. The whole legend of the lost Dutchman and his gold. It's, it's this mountain range that's just surrounded by folklore. And, uh, it's just fascinating. At least if you're a nerd, like I am, uh, and in scouts, we took a couple backpacking trips into that range. And I just remember it being just rugged country and beautiful views and all the, all the stories and history wrapped up in that range. I loved it. And at the time I was living in the Eastern part of the Phoenix Valley and could just see the, the face of these mountains almost every day going to and from work. And I decided that's where I wanted to go. So I had a wife and a toddler at the time. Uh, and told them, well, the toddler, he didn't care, told my wife, hey, I really have this just like this, this desire to do a solo overnight backpacking trip out in the, out in the superstitions. And my wife, God bless her. She is a one, she's a wonderful woman, a terrific wife, very understanding and and very aware of how fragile the male ego is. And so I could see her trying to find the words uh, to ask the question and she couldn't find a nicer way to say it than, do you know how to do that? Which just cuts a man's soul wide open. Uh, cause of course I know how to do that. I was a boy scout, dang it. Um, to her credit in all of our time together, she had never seen me go backpacking, certainly never alone. Uh, and she grew up in a, an outdoors hunting camping family, but they always followed the, the typical rule of thumb that you never go anywhere alone. You always have a buddy, but I had life insurance and she could see it was something super important to me. So she just gave me her blessing. Like, okay, figure it out. I trust you. So I began just deep dive researching because that's the kind of guy I am. So I was looking at trails and destinations and, and places and, and where I was going to go, I was starting to acquire some gear. And I, I stumbled upon this place like right in the middle of the mountain range called Rivas Ranch. 
and uh, and Revis Ranch is named after old man Elisha Revis, who in the middle of the 19th century left his family in the eastern part of the country, came all the way out here, wandered his way back into the middle of the superstitions, and set up a ranch. Uh, Up until the 1990s, you could still see his ranch house. It burned down in a fire, but there's still the foundation of it. There's just all these farm tools lying around, and it's it's this amazing place. I could see why he, he picked it, because you hike through just this brutal, rugged desert terrain, and then as you get back to where the ranch is located, you're at an elevation where it shifts into more of a pine forest, and there's a, a creek that runs by all year long, which it's hard to find, annual, constant, reliable uh, water out in the desert. It's there. There's these, these rich meadows. Uh, it, it's just this beautiful, picturesque place, and it's about seven or eight miles in from the trailhead. And so I thought, that's where I want to go. That sounds incredible. I want to do that. Um, and so I started planning my route and getting my gear and and looking into everything I needed to know. And as I was reading up on this hike and, and the ranch, uh, I just stumbled upon, upon like what almost seemed like a throwaway line in whatever article I was reading that... Uh, Old Man Revis planted an apple orchard back there, which is still producing to this day, and it mentioned that it is not uncommon for bears to come in to eat the apples. And then the article moved on, but but something about bears uh, stuck out to me, because at this point, I'm this is 10 years ago, I have barely been hunting, I had not encountered a bear in the wild ever, uh, and I started to think back on Boy Scouts, like, okay, what do you do if you run into a bear? Um, and I remember hearing two different things. Like I remember guidance that you like make yourself look big and loud and, and yell at the bear and it's supposed to run away. And then I also always heard you, you play dead in the event of a bear attack. And it occurred to me that if one of those is the correct move, you really don't want to do the other one. Like there are no two more polar opposite reactions to a bear encounter than to play dead or to make a bunch of noise and look really big and active and alive. Uh, so I started digging into like, what, what is the truth? What should I do? Uh, and it turns out as I did some research and many of you may already know that the correct answer depends on the bear, which is so reassuring when you don't actually know what you're doing in the wilderness. Uh, that it turns out basically like black bears, smaller, more skittish, uh, they are the, like, make a bunch of noise, look real big, scare them away bears. Uh, grizzly bears, on the other hand, are the, I don't care about you, I am on the top of the food chain, you better play dead, because I'm going to kill you. Uh, fortunately, I live in Arizona, there are no grizzlies here. Only black bears, that's all I was going to be dealing with. So, look big, make a bunch of noise, and most of the time they run away. Now, the most of the time caught my eye, because I thought, well, what about the other of the time? Uh, and it turns out, the experts say, if a black bear uh, is not scared away by you, but insists on coming in, maybe even attacking you, what you're supposed to do is not run away because they can run faster than you. Uh, You don't climb a tree because they can climb better than you. You stand your ground and you fight the bear, (laughs) which is just awesome to think about. Uh, Like, oh my goodness. I could picture myself with like, having this uh this bear fight and then i've got like the the scar running down my face like i'm a bond villain and i just have this incredible story to tell for the rest of my life so uh, i'm heading into the wilderness with this that weird man uh like two parts of my brain like most of me is like wow i really hope that doesn't happen and then there's another very real part of me that thinks i kind of hope this happens um at the time i did not own a pistol so i knew i was going in with nothing but a pocket knife to protect me Uh, I didn't tell any of this bear information to my wife, by the way, because she probably would have canceled my trip for me. Hey guys, this is Eric from Late to the Game Outdoors and producer of Hunting Stories. I wanted to thank Bun and Beanster for making this show possible. These guys are the real deal. Whether you're a seasoned business owner or a startup or running a side hustle like I am, they can help you with your branding, logo, easy to manage websites, and fresh creative ideas for your business. They can also help you look the part by helping you design those tricky one-off events. They deliver amazing printed goods, quality apparel, even signage. Truly a one-stop creative shop. And they stand by their work guaranteed. For free consultations and useful resources, go to bunandbeanster.com to check them out or catch them on Instagram at bunandbeanster. Now back to the show. So, 
the big day finally arrives, and I, I kiss my wife and son goodbye. Uh, I throw my gear in the truck, and I drive along this uh, long, dusty dirt road to get to this trailhead. And I, I strap on my gear, and I start hiking in, and I am just on top of the world. Like, this is exactly what I wanted. It is just me and the wilderness. Like, whatever that thing in me that wanted to be wild, that wanted to prove something to myself, whatever it is, that, that part of me is so happy. And so I hike these seven or eight rocky, grueling miles, and I get back into the ranch, and it's every bit as beautiful as I expected. Um, it just cool, antique farming equipment lying around, and, and just... I pick out a spot and set up my camp. Uh, I head down to the stream to get some water. While, while I'm there, some deer just come down to get a drink. And they're back in, this is this this mountain range is a preserve where there's no hunting. So they, they apparently have no fear of man whatsoever. Like they just look up at me and go back to drinking. They didn't care at all. Um, it was just awesome. And so I sat there next to the fire, eating my dinner and just like watching the sunset in this, the, the, ranch is kind of in this bowl and so there's just mountains and hills all around me and oh it's just magnificent and then it gets dark and as any of you who are outdoorsmen know the the woods or the wilderness is a very different place when it's dark uh, and especially different when you're all by yourself like the last human being I saw was probably five miles away towards the start of the trail. And they were on their way out as I was on my way in. And I am now sitting here in the dark by the fire and everything in my head is all of this bear research that I've been doing and I'm getting freaked out. Like I am, I'm doing all I can to stave off a panic attack because I just feel the weight of Oh my gosh, I'm about to get eaten by a bear and there is no one that's going to come and help. There's there's no help coming until my wife realizes, oh, I didn't come home. I should probably send someone to find his remains. That is where my head is at. And as I'm sitting there wrestling with all of this, sure enough, I hear a little rustle in the tall grass behind me. And so I grab my flashlight and I flip around and shine that light out there expecting to see a giant bear coming my way. And there's nothing, nothing at all. No sign of movement, no sign of life, no sign of anything, but I know I heard something. And so I try to convince myself, okay, it's just your brain playing tricks on you. It turned back around, try to enjoy the fire, try to think about anything else. Sure enough, another little stick crack behind me. Flip around with the light, nothing there. This goes on for at least four or five different times where I sit there, calm myself down, I hear another sound, flip around with the light, there's nothing there, back and forth, back and forth, and I am just really starting to, to freak myself out. And then as I'm sitting there, like about to panic, this wave of testosterone or bravery or absolute foolishness just kind of comes over me, and I start giving myself this pep talk, like, dang it, you are a man. Like, you are at the top of the food chain. You're not going to sit here being scared by some invisible noise in the grass behind you. Like you, you own this wilderness. This is yours and dang it, nothing's going to chase you out of here. And right as I have this thought, I hear another stick crack behind me. And so this time I stand up and I fling my leg over that log like, all oh, right, let, whatever you invisible psycho bear, let's do this. And I stomp down towards the noise and a bunny rabbit comes leaping out of the grass at me and I scream like a tiny wounded baby goat and trip over the log that I was sitting on. I almost fell right into my own campfire and the little rabbit who is equally scared goes just skipping off into the night like nothing ever happened and I have to sit back down because I am milliseconds from passing out like my my heart rate just shot through the roof and so I'm sitting there like slowly realizing I'm not about to die and then it, it occurs to me what has just happened and how deeply terrified I was by a little eight ounce rabbit in the grass and I have the follow-up thought of you are not a man uh you are a tiny baby girl and you should probably just go to bed 
So I just, with every ounce of shame, I, I kicked my fire down. I, I slid into my tent and uh, had the worst night's sleep in the history of my life. Uh, just every, every sound, every time a blade of grass rustled against the tent, I was awake. Uh, it, it was miserable. Uh, I was awake at least half the night, just, just sitting there, riding it out, waiting for daylight. And then, of course, as anyone who's been in the backcountry alone knows that, like, once the sun comes up again, it's mad, it's magnificent. It's just, it's incredible. Like, there is no fear. Everything's beautiful again. There's something about the sunrise and the cool air, and it just, like, it revives your spirit, and I felt great again. Packed up my camp, hit the trail, got back to the truck, uh, and, and, and made it back home alive to all the, the joy of my wife and child. But ultimately, like, d despite my absolute embarrassment and shame from that bunny moment, uh, I, I had proven to myself what I wanted to prove, like... Yes, I can go out all by myself, survive. It might not be the most glamorous or masculine thing at every single moment, but but I can do that alone. I can come back out. I can take care of myself. It was it was profoundly good for my soul to go through that, you know, 24, 36 hours, however long it was, 16 miles on the trail over two days. It felt like I had accomplished something, like I had conquered something and not like, oh, I conquered the mountain, but like I had conquered this fear of this, this thing I had wanted to do. Even in Boy Scouts, I remember like some of the older, more experienced scouts did like these little solo trips. And I always thought, man, I want to do that, but I never made it to that point. And so finally doing that was just incredible for me. And I think coming out of that, now I've spent uh, plenty of nights solo in the back country uh, and it wasn't immediately easy. That wasn't the, f the only night I've ever been scared out there on my own. Uh, but the more and more you do it, the, the more comfortable you get and, and the less the fear takes over and, and the easier it becomes. And so what I would say, if there's anything to learn from that is, uh, well, first of all, to, to be smart. Like now I am never solo in the back country without a pistol. Uh, that probably would have helped an awful lot. Although I probably would have fired an entire magazine at that bunny because I was panicking. Uh, aside from playing it smart, I would say like, don't let the, the fear of, of what if deter you. Uh, don't like give in to those thoughts. Like it can feel very panicky, very like I have to get out of here. I can't do this. You can ride through that. Like you can overrule your, your panic and your emotions and you can choose to stay out there. And I think one, one piece of wisdom that I, I unintentionally did right, uh, is that if you're going to do this, if you're going to try for your first time ever, go solo backpack, solo hunt, whatever, I would personally recommend go far enough in that you can't come back out easily. Like if, if I had chosen a trail or a spot where I was just like two miles from the trailhead or something, I can guarantee I would have been packing up my tent and hiking out by flashlight because uh, I just wasn't going to, it was, it was terrifying. But knowing that I was eight miles in, the, it was a scarier thought to try to hike out eight miles in the dark for the first time than to just sit there and grit it out and just get through that night no matter what it took. So I would say if you're, if you're considering this, uh, pick a spot that's, you know, three, four miles at least, like somewhere that uh, it it's going to be scarier or more daunting to hike out at night than it is to just ride it out. Because you, you can make it through that night, maybe you don't sleep great, uh, but eventually the sun is coming up again, at the risk of sounding like Annie. And when it does, like, th the fear's gone, you're fine, and there, there's all this accomplishment, like, oh man, okay, I made it, I can do this. So that tale of woe, tale of embarrassment, um, I'm, I'm happy to share because, well, why should we pretend that we're all super masculine and fearless all the time? Because we're not. Uh, but I hope, if anything, it just inspires someone that, that man, yeah, it, it seems scary in your head, but the reality is, is far less frightening. Um, and the, the more you do it and the more you push yourself, just the more opportunities open up. Like, I, I love solo hunting because I'm the kind of guy who I love solitude. Like, I love my family. I love my friends. I, I love people. 
I'm not saying that, but it is necessary for me to get some time where it is just me, uh, just to stay like mentally healthy. And, and I think as a hunter in particular, there's a lot of opportunities that present themselves when you're not trying to coordinate a whole bunch of other guys' schedules. Like even if you have one good hunting partner, man, there's going to be times where you want to go on a trip or your vacation doesn't line up with his vacation or, or whatever it is, or something last minute comes up for one of you. And now none of you can go because the, the whole thing falls apart. If you, if you have to be with somebody. And so I think there's a whole lot of freedom and a whole lot of extra opportunity that comes when it is just you and your schedule that you have to figure out to get out in the wilderness. So I would challenge you if you're at all interested in doing that, take a solo trip, start small. Maybe it's not even a hunting trip. It's, you're just going to go scout a place you've always wanted to hunt and you're just going to camp overnight. Or maybe it's a trail that you could easily make the loop in the day but you just choose to, to stay back there overnight. And, uh, and if it's a place you've been before and you're comfortable with, it should help alleviate some of that fear. But I would just say, give it a try. Cause, uh, I have found incredible, uh, it, it's incredibly rewarding, uh, just great benefits that this idea of solo backpacking, solo hunting has brought to my life. I think it can bring a lot to your life as well. Be smart, let people know where you're going have, uh, if you don't have cell service, maybe, uh, get something like a Garmin in reach where no matter where you're at, you can get a hold of somebody. You can summon emergency personnel, carry first aid stuff, like, like all the basics. You got to like be extra vigilant on all of that when you're alone. But I personally don't think it's foolish to be out there alone. I know some people, even some people in my family would disagree. Uh, not my wife, just extended family, but to me, it's worth the risk. Um, so I'm going to start rambling. I'm going to wrap this up. Grab yourself a pack, grab your gear and get out there and enjoy the beauty of the wilderness and solitude. It is deeply, deeply good for your soul. Thanks so much for tuning in to Hunting Stories. And if you want to stay up on what we're doing with the podcast or anything else going on with Late to the Game, Go ahead and check us out at latetothegameoutdoors.com or give us a follow on Instagram at latetothegameoutdoors. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you guys next time.